Hello, welcome to Just Bricks, brought to you by the Sporting News and Kick It Forward. I'm Josh Garth. I've got a very special co-host today and a big interview with Alex Tui later on in the program. Uh, six-time defending, <laughs> six-time <laughs> defender of the year. Uh, um, is it five-time champion? Six. Six-time champion, I take it back. Um, and also just had his jersey retired by the Perth Wildcats. Perth Wildcats officially legend. Damien Martin, how are you going? I'm good, I'm good. That moment when it dropped from the rafters, I can honestly say, is one of the best things, sport, the best moments sport has ever brought to me. And just looking across to seeing my wife, three daughters, mum, dad, sister flew in for her, eldest brother flew in for the moment. Uh, yeah, it just made that even that more meaningful. And then how many people stuck around from the Red Army. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's something I'll never forget, nor will I take for granted. And walking into the following game and seeing it up there, yeah, still, I don't think it's quite hit home. Well, you've, um you obviously were part of the woodwork with the Wildcats. You saw so much there. Is there any moment, and you've probably spoken about this a lot recently, that sticks out for you as the, the really um, memorable championship out of the six you had or anything the, like that? The first one was the most fun. Uh, mm. That's the only way I can explain it. We didn't come into the season with many expectations. And I remember we played round one up in Townsville and Kevin Lish, our new import, he just graduated from college, he came over and hit a game winner from behind half court. And then I remember Trevor Gleeson, who was then coaching the Townsville Crocodiles, went into lock, the locker room and apparently gave an all-time spray <laughs> to his team saying, I can't believe we just lost to this team. They're not going to do anything this season. <laughs> Fast forward and uh, we end up winning the championship and then Trevor ended up moving over here a few years later. But that year was fun. The year it was all where we had James Ennis. Mm. You know, we won the preseason tournament. I want to say we started the season about 12 wins, one loss minor premiers all the pressure was on us to go on to win the whole championship otherwise to be honest it was going to feel like as a failure of a season and so when the final siren sounded the confetti dropped we embraced our teammates it was almost as much um you know enjoyment as there was just sheer relief you know i was just glad it was done the amount of pressure that was mounting the expectations so when it was all said and done even though jimmy actually got in foul trouble and that wasn't even the grand final mvp just knowing that we'd done something special after having so many wins prior to the grand final series, that one was special in a different way. But then the Bryce Cotton one, mm. you know, we're sitting last on the ladder at Christmas. A lot of us had gotten injured uh, earlier in the season. The defining moment for me wasn't when Bryce actually joined us. It was the week prior. There was about four of us who were injured. They were going through a losing streak. And we had one of my favorite teammates of all time in Casey Prather. Casey's an import and you don't grow up in America wanting to play for a team you've never heard of in a league you've potentially got no aspirations to be a part of whatsoever. But Casey came out here and he was determined to win at all costs. And then we had a very open and confrontational team meeting the, a couple of days before the boys were due to hit the road to, town, to uh, New Zealand. And Casey got up and he spoke about how tough the season had been to him but how much it means to him to win a championship for this club. And he got quite emotional. And he's not an emotional guy. He's a highlight reel. Yeah, he's a yeah. superstar. But rarely does the emotion come to the surface. And his raw emotion that came to the surface of how much it means to win and how stop making excuses, stop reading the papers, this, this, and this. He was spot on in every point he made. The boys got on the plane, undermanned, playing a team that were, you know, favorites to win it all, went and got the win, and then Bryce Cotton joined the team. So, you know, when Bryce joined, I want to say we won six of the next eight games. Mm. But for me, it was what Casey said to the playing group, made himself vulnerable. They went and got a win, and in the end, that win was enough for us to then go on to make the finals off the back of winning six of the final eight. But I, I credit Jay, uh, wow. that, that moment with Casey, the boys then going on an away game to New Zealand, getting the win, and then the superstar uh, came along and joined us. I've never heard that story. I didn't know... Um, well, Casey's obviously still playing. Mm -hmm. like we saw him sign with Brisbane earlier in the season, but... Uh, that was that was probably my highlight championship because I think you were in the bottom of the ladder for one period yep. and then and halfway through the season and then flew through. Bryce ends up getting um, grand final series MVP. Uh, we'll talk more about basketball in a second. The NBL season so far, also some of the Australians doing work in the the NBA. Um, you've you've had a switch from the the best ever in your craft as far as Australian defender and and, and basketballer. Um, what's it like going to talk back radio? <laughs> Well, it's one thing if it was talk back and it was two hours of basketball, it's talk back. So I've gone from commercial radio where it'd be four minute interviews and then 12 minutes of music. Yeah. Now we're doing 18 minute interviews and three <laughs> minutes of ads. Uh, and 70% of the show, the two hour show is AFL, yeah. a game I didn't grow up with. Even if you go back to country New South Wales, the town I grew up in called Gloucester, 
it's all two goalposts, not four. You know, it's, it's rugby league, it's rugby union. If Nick Natanui walked down the main street, no one would know who he is. <laughs> Yet, if a retired Newcastle Knights player from the 80s walks down, he's still getting swarmed by people. So, how I haven't been fired, I don't know. <laughs> I really, really enjoy the job. My co-host, Paul Hazelby, has been incredible mm. taking on someone who doesn't know anything about the sport he had so much success in, uh, in a job that he loves. So, I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Hopefully getting to know the game a bit better, but I still make plenty of blunders. Uh, we, we like to call Talkback Radio Stations. It's free advertising for our own podcast, because <laughs> um, which we found out... Uh, it's illegal to record conversations, but it's not illegal if it's radio, so that's fine. Um, have you had any good callers that have like, put you in your place or anything because it is maybe not right terminology or is it John from Coburn or anything like that or are you just too nice? Are you John have... from Coburn? No, no I'm not. <laughs> oh, uh, no, no, but um, any no, in particular? few blunders. So my name is Damien Martin, so I'll share the name <laughs> with a West Australian cricketer in Damien Martin who spells it E-N for Damien and Y-N in Martin. I'm A and I. But we had a, a guest on, a former cricketer, and halfway through it, we're talking about all-time greatest sprays. Uh, actually, it was Big Dipper, AFL player, but we're talking about all-time greatest sprays in the locker room from coaches or captains. And halfway through Dipper's story, he, goes, he stops and goes, hang on, what am I talking about? Marta, you must have copped some from Alan Border. Talk us about some <laughs> AB sprays, and I'm just sinking into my chair. And I didn't have the, you know, the nerve to tell him he was talking to a basketball. So I just went with it. I was like, yeah, Border sprayed me one time. You know, couldn't get on the front foot. I dropped a catch. Uh, but then another time we had Adam Simpson on, yeah. coach of the Eagles. Every Thursday he was on our show. And this was, you know, two seasons ago when they were going through a time where they just had so many injuries. They were mm. getting absolutely smashed on the scoreboard. And by Thursday, he's addressed that previous loss multiple times. <laughs> his mindset has shifted to the upcoming game. But also on a Thursday, that's when the teams are announced, the list drop. And I remember earlier in the week, Paul Hazelby, my co-host, he used to write for the Sunday Times. He'd written an article about how in the best interests of both club and coach, they should part ways. Simo's a premiership winning coach. He should go to a team that has the ability to win a premiership because he'll bring out the best in them and, and you know hopefully win a flag. For the Eagles, they need more of a development coach you know, to see them through the next five, ten years. Simo comes in. And before he could Is get, it in person? Oh, on no, the phone? sorry. On, he was about to, we're about to call in. And right before, I've never seen Hayes nervous about any guests <laughs> we've got. He goes, hey, look, in case, you know, things could be a bit rough because of the article I wrote. I know he's read the article. Can you please not make any mistakes? Because the amount of times we'd have Simo on and I'd use a basketball terminology instead of a footy one or I'd just ask something silly that you just don't ask a senior yeah, coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that actually made me nervous seeing Hayes nervous. On a Thursday, because of this drop, I thought, okay, I'm going to keep it nice and simple. The only question in this 20-minute interview I'm going to ask is, should we expect any surprises when the, the teams are announced? And so they're going back and forth, and Simo made it aware that he'd read the article because Hayes had asked a question, and Simo goes, oh, why would you even care, Hayes? Hayes, you don't think I should be here next <laughs> season? And we're like, oh, I'm just sinking into my chair. And then it was my time to shine, ask the simple question. I said, all right, Simo, it's Thursday. Teams are about to drop. Should we expect, expect any surprises to your starting five? And I heard myself say starting five. I've looked over at Hayes and he's just shaking his head. <laughs> Luckily, Simo knows that I don't know a thing about the game. He giggled and he said, oh, well, in basketball, it might be a starting five. But for uh, our best 22, this is, uh, this is about to be announced. So well, he was great. Well, under fire, coach. I mean, if he's not going to spray you, there'll be um, one bloke in Dianella that will anyway. No, um, <laughs> I, that, I actually used to do a weekly segment with Simo where we would set him up for Fox Sports. I used to be a Fox Sports reporter. And um, there was always just a lot of not speaking. Waiting. It was always really, really nice. Um, but I didn't know much about footy. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember him asking me, oh, how was uh, the Dockers training today? And I was like, yeah, it was all right. And then he goes, what do they normally do there? And I was like, but he was basically asking me what sort of Trying training things insight, I do. And yeah. I was like, I don't know. And then that was sort of the extent. <laughs> he was always very, very nice and actually pretty funny. But um, I remember a couple of times he was sort of like, I think sort of probing to see if I knew anything. And it came back, it was zero. So Well, or he thinks that, okay, this guy's disciplined. We can trust him at Eagles training sessions because he's, he's ever with, <laughs> yeah, with yeah. Justin. I don't have to worry about him revealing any of what our training session looked like. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> well, that's good. It's flying, obviously, in talk, talk yeah. back. But I, I mean, this town's so... Uh, the basketball setup here actually is so strong. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is the Wildcats and what you guys helped create right now. What have you made of the season so far? You're a part of the commentary with the NBL. Um, 
Wildcats just locked in the top two. Um, yeah, what have you have you are you enjoying that side of it? Um, and what have you made of the season so far? Yeah, loving the commentary. So there's two roles I play. Occasionally I do the play by play, where you sit there and you get so engrossed in what's going on every single possession that I get in the car afterwards and I'm mentally fatigued, like I would have been uh, when I was out there playing. Uh, the other job is just walk around and you just got to give a bit of feedback as to what's going on during timeouts. I don't mind admitting on your show, I've got no idea what they're saying during timeouts. <laughs> the Red Army are that loud, you can't hear a word. So I'm kind of looking at the whiteboard. I'm trying to learn how to read lips. In the end, I'm, I'm making a bit of a mess. <laughs> so that's what's going on. But that's just fun. You go around, you catch up with people, you get to see the players and just enjoy the game with the best seats in the house. When it comes to the season so far, you've got to give big props to a few people. At the end of the year, there's a few they should get up there, the MVP awards. You know, Bryce is the best player in the league this season by a mile, has been for a number of years. He'll take out the major individual gong. But John really, with the changes he made, both with, he didn't fire anyone, he didn't cut anyone. He just made some changes with who he's going to start, the style of the game. And Trevor Gleeson used to say, the best five that play together will be out there. Now, not the best individuals, best mm. five on paper, the five that played the best together. And I think JR, you know, has done something similar by Jordan Usher is a star in his own right, but he plays a different style that doesn't necessarily bring out the best in Bryce Cotton. Mm. Whereas he dropped him to the bench after five losses and he brought in Hiram Harris. Hiram is a role player. He knows his role. He embraces it. He plays it to the best of his ability. And part of that's controlling the tempo, playing really hard, screening, getting other players involved. He doesn't need the ball in his hands to truly shine. In fact, there's been multiple games where he's probably been the third best player for the Wildcats and he might finish with sub 10 points, but he's been brilliant. Jesse Wagstaff had three did not play coach's decision games. It was around his um, commemorative his, game, his 400. right? Yeah, he didn't 400. get step foot on the court during his 400th. Whereas Jesse, the first time he subbed in after not suiting up, sorry, not getting out there for two consecutive games, was he went and set an onboard drag screen in transition for Bryce, knowing that for the previous five years, Bryce is at his best when it's a kick ahead in transition with a drag screen going middle. He either rejects it, goes baseline, or he goes and uses it. He's got multiple op options from there. And then he set multiple screens so that Bryce could then do curl cuts, flare screens, kickbacks. So I just think that a number of changes, and you know who else I'd want to credit? Rachel Cotton. Did you see her tweet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was brilliant. And you know what? There's not one word of it I didn't disagree mm. with. And so I just think that the combination of having role players in there to complement their superstars and Christian Doolittle's been brilliant, but you bring in a new player who's a star on most of the teams he's been a part of, now Embrace being that second or third key part behind Bryce, behind Keanu, he's been brilliant. I think he's kind of been the unsung hero alongside Harris and Wagstaff, but Bryce has gone to another level because of he's got, he's got players complementing his skill set, uh, not just necessarily standing around saying, here's the ball, go and take on five players. Yeah, the stagnation around, and also him playing uh, major ball handler where previously he would always hit up Mitch Norton or yourself mm. and he could come off screens and everything. I remember watching the Brisbane game early when they lost at home and uh, we were dressed as cats and we were there. But, like, but it was probably the worst night for it because it was like a really, it was a tough night to watch. And since then, they've been flying from the small changes, which you said they haven't fought anyone. But then you look at someone like the Sydney Kings who have all the talent in the world, mm -hmm. but it feels like sometimes there's too many cooks in the kitchen and maybe it's a... But they also keep changing the starting lineup, so they're just not finding that continuity as well. You've got to find, you know, if you'd say it's a jigsaw puzzle, you've got to get the right pieces that fit together mm. and that way you can actually build your puzzle. Sometimes you've got too many of the same pieces, they bump heads, they don't go, they don't connect and all of a sudden you just got them standing out there playing to their weaknesses, which might be spacing the floor. You've got Alex Tui uh, on the show. I'm a massive fan of Alex Tui. He's so versatile, but I would love to see the ball in his hand more because he's a smart player. Yes, he's a rookie, he's a next star, but him just spacing the floor and being a knockdown shooter who'll crash the rebound and play solid defense, he has more to offer to that mm. team than just that. But that's the piece of the puzzle they've given him, whereas other players haven't necessarily brought out the best in their teammates, not because they're selfish, it's just because there's too many similar styles of players out there and maybe not a clear identity or a clear style of play because they haven't had that connectivity first and foremost, but the clarity because they are chopping and changing. Is this working? Is this not working? I credit JR by making a tweak to the starting five. But other than that, he doesn't really make too many other changes. You know what you're going to get from him. Whereas Sydney, at times, I look at them going, I'm a big fan of the club. I grew up in New South Wales, love the Kings. Right now, I don't think they've got everyone on the same page. Just before I ask something about uh, 
being one of the greatest defenders ever and watching players. Um, do you happen to know any anything about the New Zealand Breakers? Are they okay for next year? Because there's they've been such a there was a bit of talk they might be folding that the franchise is in trouble. No, they won't be won't be folding. Fine, and I touch wood. <laughs> unless you hear something I haven't. Even if a club eventually wants to sell, there's going to be buyers. Okay. So I don't know what the current ownership group are hoping to do at the end of the season. I really don't. Hopefully they want to stick around for the long term. But the NBL is in such a good position okay. financially, marketing, attendances, viewership, that if another license comes up, like we saw with the Perth Wildcats when sadly Jack Bender did decide to sell due to his health problems at the time, there's going to be buyers. I, I was speaking to a Kiwi mate and I explained that to him that there was a little bit of talk about it previously in the season. He was so surprised because in Auckland, the two most supported teams are the Wars, like the mm. Warriors and then the Breakers because despite how strong their union sides are, they still don't get fill out the stadiums, which yep. I, I was shocked about. Um, well, my one question was, I, I, you hear about coaches that were extremely good at one specific skill like Shane Hill and Andrew Gaze, two Australian greats. They're, they can't even fathom how, like Shane Hill can't fathom how guys aren't training 19 hours a day and Andrew Gaze can't figure out why guys aren't shooting 40% from deep and 90% from the free throw <laughs> line. As a coach, you hear that from people that have had them. When you're watching people defend, are you like, why isn't that guy just doing all the intangible, doing all the one percenters? Why isn't he diving on the ball? Sometimes, and I'm now really stealing a Trevor Gleeson thing, What's easy to do is easy not to do. Yeah. And it's a case of you don't know what you don't know. So if you watch film, imagine how many times, if you were to break it down, how many times players have gone from having their hands outstretched where you're taking away vision, you're potentially taking away rhythm and timing of someone on a curl cut because they've got to go wider. You're taking away how a person with the ball passes. It might be a slower bounce pass or a lob if you're taking away a direct one. Are they staying in a stance? And, you know, Andrew Bogut's one of the best defenders of all time and I loved playing alongside him because he was so vocal. Mm. You knew that you could crawl up and into your defender, into the person you're defending because you knew he was behind you. When times are quiet, help left, help right, you're not hearing that. Send him baseline, send him to me, you're not hearing that. Then you become a little bit more tentative because if you get beaten, where are your teammates? So if you stay in a stance with your hands up, you're vocal and you will go above and beyond to make those extra... Uh, slides to commit to a charge or whatever it might be then you can go from being a very average defender individually and a very average defensive team to being good straight away with three very basic things that you can control but when you get tired you stop talking when you get tired you put your hands down when you're worried about the turnover or miss shot you just got your mind space isn't in the present and you're not worried about the the scout of the left hand and right hand and what's your strengths and weaknesses so a lot of that you can actually train when you give the examples of those offensive weapons you know, I don't care how many hours I would have spent with Gazy. I'm never going to be able to shoot the ball as well as he did, unfortunately. Not even close. Uh, so this, I think it's easier to translate becoming a, a better defender because you can control a lot of those things than potentially turning into a, an offensive style like those names you mentioned. Now, making a read on the game, backing yourself that if 80% of the time that play spins left, spins right, so when he turns blindside, I'm going to be there to run and jump and get a steal or draw a charge. You know, that's not something you necessarily encourage until they've watched enough film, unless they've proven right. to you in training that they can make those reads because that can sometimes be detrimental to your team if you run and jump and give away an open shot if you don't get the steal. So some of it I encourage for everyone to do. Others you've still got to earn. And Trevor and Rob Beveridge, they gave me the green light to go and make my mistakes, but they backed me in to make those decisions when I wanted to try and get a steal. It just feels like you're just getting a bit defensive, mate. <laughs> Sorry, just want to use a sound. I just want to show off. Um, Is there a crickets one? Uh, there's a golf club. There's plenty. Uh, I won't get into it right now. We have, we're running out of time. Um, a couple more things. Let's turn to the NBA side of things. Uh, Josh Giddy's had a bit of a down year this mm -hmm. year. Well, compared to the last two years where it was constantly going up. Um, but included a little bit of trade talk online as well. What have you made of his season uh, so far and his development as a point guard? Oh, he's a human and what he's had to deal with the adversity off the court. You know, I think anybody that would have to go through something like that, it'd be hard not to have it carry over. And whether it's just little things like all of a sudden he's not sticking around to do the extras. And I'm, I have no idea if he is or not, yep. but there is that facet to his game. And also just the age he is, he's still so young and he's probably earning more respect from the defensive teams. So they're giving him, you know, 
playing him a little bit harder in the on balls and, and situations like that. He's got superstar teammates and they're so young. So I don't read too much into his season overall. I still consider him an absolute star who's eventually going to be an NBA superstar and we'll see him out there on their long weekend in June. Oh, in, sorry, in time to come with the All-Star break. But yeah, I, the boomers will be built around Josh Giddy. Uh, and I think he's a great kid, hell of a player, and his best basketball is still yet to come. What do you make of the Boomers? It was probably underwhelming the result um, in the World Cup. You know, things could go a different way where they, you know, potentially beat Germany and have a yep. different run. But uh, they, they felt like a bit of a divide from the age group. Like, so you have the older heads who still have a fantastic role in Paddy Mills and Joe Inglis, but then you have a guy like Josh Giddy who at times took over and there was no one that could sort of match him. But at the same time, the, the shooting still isn't there as well. So... Um, what do you see Paris looking like as far as game style and is there any changes you think should be made? Oh, look, you, you question who is the conduit between the older group and the younger generation. But more so, you know, has Paddy gone to Josh and said, this is your team, we'll back you in? Or does Paddy is, still Is that a big be... thing like amongst a playing group, Paddy, a leadership thing? Well, Paddy has been so good Yeah. when he's put that green and gold jersey on. You know, some of the most inspiring basketball I've ever played were games one and two at the Rio Olympics. I didn't even step foot on the court. I actually had two DMPs in the first two games against France and Serbia. But I remember sitting there and watching Paddy and Della Vadova just fighting through every screen. You know, diving on every loose ball, sprinting the lane. And then what Paddy and both guys were able to do with ball in hand was just incredible. So it'd be hard, you know, if, if Paddy is open to just saying, no, this is your team. But if Paddy can replicate what he's done at the previous two Olympics, this is still Paddy Mills' team. Yeah. Don't worry about how old he is or lack of game time in the NBA. He's proven time and time again that he can still drop 20-plus points a game uh, during the Olympic campaign. But it's just got to be, like I said, with the Sydney Kings, clear-cut clarity of what their roles are, everyone embracing it and doing it to the best of their ability. And, but there's got to be buying at the defensive end. They've got to get easy points because they don't necessarily have a player, if it's not Paddy, to then go out there and drop 20 points and create for themselves. So they've got to get in a stance, get stops, and then run out and play their best basketball in transition. And it starts at the defensive end, which leads to good offense, not the other way around. They seem to have a, a glut of sort of long defensive first guys like uh, Josh Green, Dyson Daniels and Matisse Thibel. Uh, do you see Daniels taking a bigger role at the Olympics? And two, can you see Della Vadova potentially getting a call up? We, we heard from Bogut earlier in the year how he just rocked up at the training camp mm -hmm. and just like refused to be cut despite already <laughs> being cut. And they were like, oh, okay, I guess we're running with Delhi. And then he had to be recut. I, I haven't heard uh, It was on Bogut's podcast and he just uh, he just kind of rocked up apparently. He was like, I refuse to be cut and he stopped drinking water or like cut everything out of his diet. You know what I mean? He had water. <laughs> but there was, all, you know, there was always talks about Della Vadova. It's like, oh my God, do you hear his, um, he stopped eating fat. He stopped eating this. He's only eating protein. It's like, wow, what else could he cut out? And he looks fantastic. But um, like, what, what do you see from that? Whether it's a wing that's potentially being cut for a guy like Delhi, or do they just roll with who they've got? So before I answer your question, I'll share a quick Delhi story. Okay, he's okay. one of my favorite uh, teammates of all time. I remember years and years ago, I was one of the younger players playing for the Boomers and we'd gone into the Australian Institute of Sport to do a pre-tournament, you know, training camp, whatever it may have been. And Delhi was one of the athletes on scholarship there and he was about to go away and captain the Australian under 20s team. And I remember when I was in his position, you know, we'd have the Boomers players roll through, CJ Bruton, Jason Smith, Matty Nielsen, whoever it may have been. And I'd be a nervous wreck just kind of fangirling from afar going, how cool is that? That's so-and-so. And I've just admired them for so long. I was at lunch sitting with CJ Bruton, uh, Jason Smith, two of the names I just mentioned before, uh, and one other Boomers player, I can't remember. And Delhi came up and he introduced himself and he said, is there any chance that he and I could have lunch together? And I was like, yeah, yeah of course, not a problem. And we sat down and he had a notebook and pen and he just wanted to pick my brain about my experience of captaining, captaining the Australian under-20s when we won a gold medal with Andrew Bogut dominating, Reese Carter, Alex Marriage, Aaron Bruce, Stevie Markovic, you know, to name a few. And I remember I left that meeting going, how good is it that this kid mm. is not going to leave any stone unturned? I don't think I helped him in any way, shape or form, but at least we got to sit there and just go back and forth for about 45 minutes and realize this kid has the X factor. Fast forward a couple of years, had he been a part of the Australian program prior to 2019, he would have taken my spot for 2020 World Cup, but then he would end up did taking my spot for 2012 <laughs> and we ended up getting to work together. So he doesn't surprise me because he lives the green and gold. And would I have him in, in my team? Absolutely. 
because even if you're not running this offensive structure through him, he is a guy that at training is going to demand excellence from every single one of his teammates. And they'll listen because of the, the career he's had. He got hospitalized after guarding Steph Curry during the NBA championships. He's given up everything to be part of this Boomers team. His attitudes are contagious for the right reasons. I don't necessarily know that about all the other players they've brought in because I don't know them personally. I'm only speculating from some of the stories that have come out of camp. With Adeli in that team, I think that he brings out the best in everyone involved and he separates that gap between older generation who have been there, done it, and young studs trying to play their way. Uh, one more before we get to um, Aaron Chew with Alex Tui. Oh, actually, two more, sorry. Is that right? Yeah, yeah okay, no, cool. <laughs> um, uh, what have you made of Dwight Wraith's season? He's obviously oh. connected to WA and all of a sudden, going into this year, you think, oh, Jock Landau, he was injured during the World Cup. He's going to take this spot uh, for the Olympics and run with it. He's not really playing. And then all on the other side of things, you have this guy who, um, up until sort of about the 5th of Feb, before a bit of a, uh, in, I think he's, he must be injured or something yeah. right now, uh, is flying and he seems to be fearless and he's shooting from everywhere and everything. I love him. I got to know <laughs> him a little bit off the court. He's as nice a guy as you'll ever meet. So down to earth, goes above and beyond for the South Sudanese community here in Western Australia. Just a lovely fella. So when I saw he got the 10 day contract, I think it started initially with Portland. The, he made the most of it. And now to see him flat out balling when he's out there fit and healthy, he will be a big part of his Boomers program for Paris. And he can stretch the floor so that you can have Giddy out there, pick and pop situations. But he plays hard. I was lucky enough to go down to Bend at uh, Basketball Stadium prior to the Olympic uh, camp before they went away to Worlds. And he had Duop Reith, he had Harry Wessels, who's going to be a star, currently playing at St. Mary's. And Nick K, the three of them training against each other every single day, preparing for this Olympic um, Some big bodies. tryout. But he, all three have completely different styles <laughs> yeah, of game. Yeah. But the competitive nature, it was brilliant. But Duop, in that setting, he actually was the standout. So it was no real surprise he went on to do what he did, both at the World Cup and then more recently, um, the NBA. Does he start over Landau, you think, at this stage? I think he does, just because, you know, I've listened to Bogut talk about how important it is going into these types of tournaments with game time in your legs. Mm. Uh, but having that one-two punch in the center position is big time for them. Nick Kay will never make mistakes defensively. He'll play harder than anyone else at the tournament. Highly skilled player, but I prefer Nick in the four spot. With Duop and Jock, you can rotate them 4-5 or 5-4. Whereas Nick, I want him to play at his strengths as a power forward. Uh, just before we uh, move on, a couple of the standout younger guys this year. Um, Alex Saar, obviously playing with the Perth Wildcats and Alex Tui over Ace. But uh, some college prospects right now. For Johnny Furphy from Kansas, <laughs> lighting it up. He's getting shouted out by all these, uh, by all the, the scouts mm -hmm. across the world. Um, I think he's averaging about nine points per game in a team that's pushing for you know NCAA uh, berth as well. Uh, there's him... Condon in uh, Florida, uh, and then, oh, sorry, I've, I've forgotten his name all of a sudden, from Duke, uh, from Sydney oh, as well. Oh, Tyrese Proctor. Tyrese Proctor as well. We've got a, we seem to have a lot of talent over there right now, out, including them and the uh, also the uh, Australians playing in the NBL. Is there anyone that's stuck out for you or anyone you've liked watching and then you've... Oh, Condon, what Condon is doing as a freshman in the SEC for Florida is absolutely amazing. He's getting double-doubles for the Gators week in, week out. He had six blocks the other day in like nine minutes or something. He's already signed a deal in the <laughs> AFL as a Category B player. With so, Collingwood, right? Yeah, with Collingwood. So if things didn't go well in basketball, he had a fallback. I don't think we'll ever see him in a Magpies <laughs> Guernsey. I think he'll be playing in the NBA. So I love seeing what Alex is doing. You mentioned Johnny Furphy. I don't think anyone expected him to go to college, but he had a, a breakout tournament playing for Australia. Uh, and then Kansas, you know, just mm. offered him a deal too good to say no to. But now he's an established player in that roster. Again, in one of the strongest tournaments, uh, conferences in the league. Harry Wessels at St. Mary's, Rory Hawk at St. Mary's. There is a number of players that whether they stay all four years or come back early, they're going to play for Australia at the Olympics at some stage. And then there's a bunch coming through. Uh, Roman just got named the Bob Staunton Award winner at the under 20s. Whether he decides to turn pro or decides to go to college, uh, you know, Rocco Zakarski, your next star. Uh, Do you mean, uh, is that rap? You're talking about the guy that won the under 20 nationals? Roman Salupa. Salupa. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry. He just got named in the basketball without borders. Yeah, so yeah. he'll be heading over there. So he'll, do, he'll be wonderful over there. Uh, there's so many youngsters coming through, but it's a good problem for the boomers to have in the future is who makes that 12 when, you know, similar to what we're seeing right now, where it's the, sorry, unlike what we're seeing right now, it's the older generation and younger. There's going to come a time where you've got 20 really good players aged between 22 and 26, 27. 
who are all coming into their prime because you don't play your best basketball till you're 27 or 31. Mm. So who do they take? You know, Rocco Zakarski, you've got to take along for the ride. Alex Condon I put in there, Harry Wessels, but all of a sudden Johnny Furphy, Tyrese Proctor, who doesn't make it is going to be, a, you know, the toughest decision of all. Not to mention there's all the guys that we don't even know yet. There's the guys that come out of nowhere, they have a chip on their shoulder, they're all of a sudden they force their way in uh, through the program right now. Quick shout out to the Opals as well. Uh, qualified for Paris as well um, for the Olympic qualifiers, Beck Allen, All-Star 5. They dominated, and that's they'll be without uh, Lauren Jackson. She's announced she won't be there. Mm. Uh, but great to see the girls are going to be there as well. They've been so dominant. Um, I was surprised they weren't even qualified, I think, because they got bronze at the World Championships, so they didn't automatically qualify. Uh, but, yeah, great great work for the Opals. They're going to be fun t- fantastic watch as and well. And the depth they've got is amazing. Yeah. I love that Sandy Brondello pretty much convinced their old friend and, and player uh, to be there for the tournament. <laughs> so I think Lauren Jackson had no plans to board the plane and go to Brazil. But Sandy called her and said just one more because – it did take a big shift in culture when they had, say, Liz Cambridge and the, everything that happened there. But credit, you know, Tess Madgen, not only did she absolutely kill it out there uh, for those couple of games in Brazil, but her leadership has been amazing. But I think Lauren had a strong enough personality and, you know, she is the GOAT. To, but to hear it from her saying, girls, we can do this even without Liz, who I still believe is probably the best player. But Ezzy coming through now, mm. she is phenomenal. The balance is there. Their, their depth is amazing. So even through injury, they're still going to be a medal chance. US, China, Serbia, the Opals, throw a blanket over probably six nations. That's going to be your medalist. The Opals are well and truly a part of that. Well, they were pretty dominant for most of the game against Serbia. They came and pushed at the end, but mm. I thought that was just really good to see. Damien, um, we've taken enough of your time. Thanks so much for coming in. Maybe we'll have you again sometime over the over the season or whatever we do, um, if you're not too busy. I'm busy that day. I've got to still learn football. I haven't said, <laughs> I haven't said the day, but um, busy. Uh, we've got Alex Tui on the program right now. I caught up with him while I was in Sydney. I really want to look out for... Uh, in the years to come just such a young guy playing for the Kings uh, remember to subscribe to the page and review the podcast if you can and listen to the main pod for Kick It Forward on Monday Alex Tui from the Sydney Kings thanks for joining me and it's your first year as a pro um, what's it been like mate you seem to be have adjusted pretty well yeah it's been a lot of fun obviously um, heard a lot about the NBL and kind of been around the guys a bit before I signed so Got to get a taste of what it was like and it's something that I enjoyed and now being full-time here, I'm, I'm loving it, loving the lifestyle, I'm loving the people around it. Uh, pretty early on, I saw you like the um, one of the national championships and you are playing with the ACT mm. and it was like a one-man wrecking crew, <laughs> just like shooting threes, getting your own rebound, put-back dunks and everything. So I, I'm an early 2E fan, I like yeah. to think. Um, what's the jump in now going to the NBL pros? Because you played a lot of NBL 1 and did really well, but obviously it's different what's something you didn't expect from being in the nbl yeah i think it's a big jump obviously getting to play against full-time professionals grown men um, i think the biggest thing is probably the physicality i think that's a lot of things a lot of things that guys preach is coming in the league is super physical mm. um, the athleticism is another level and just the size of the body so adjusting with that has been a big thing for me and kind of finishing around the rim has been a big um, area for me to try and improve in and keep improving in just I understand kind of getting bumped off, so just staying strong down there. But I'd say physicality is the, the biggest jump. What about training? So we, you're, you guys are in a bit of a slump right now. You started extremely strong, but that was a very intense training. Um, it's like went a half an hour extra. It's, do you enjoy that? Uh, what's it like being in this part of a professional career where you're not winning? Yeah, no, it's definitely changed. Obviously, I had some great results at the start of the season and kind of dipped a little bit. So I think. Like, I think we just got to take it one day at a time. And I think those trainings that go a bit longer, you don't really worry about that. You're just trying to play every possession like it's our last. And that's kind of the attitude we're going to have to take the rest of the season is every single possession, every single quarter matters. It's not just, oh, we'll figure it out. We've got a few more games. So we've missed that opportunity. So now it's just get after it every time. Uh, you surprise heaps of people with your athleticism. You keep doing these dunks out of nowhere. Like, there was a spin in the lane. There was one on the weekend against Brisbane yeah. where you caught someone. Um, <laughs> is that a... Has that always been something you've hung your hat on that you surprise people how athletic you are? Yeah, I mean, like all my old coaches just make fun of how, <laughs> how little I, I show it off and they don't believe me, but just got to remind them once in a while that <laughs> I can get up. My older brother doesn't believe it, so just show everyone a little bit that I, I can do a little bit here and there. You need to get your brother into the same league as you one year so you can just dump on him or something. Yeah, <laughs> so get, you get him around it. Create an NFT or some shit about that. Um, What's it been like now you're over halfway through the season, you made a huge decision decision not to go to Gonzaga. Uh, does it feel right now? And also, can you talk us through that decision when you made it? Yeah, 100% I think it's the right decision. I think 
just like the feel of myself being in this league and playing against grown men, I just feel so confident knowing that I'm, I'm young in the league but still holding my own, so I feel confident from that. Um, and then just kind of looking at college now and just seeing like the NBL is so much better than college. Like the top teams would destroy college teams and just the way we play, I think it's just helping me if I'm going to make that jump, I think getting into that early. Um, the, the process for me was a, a tricky one. I had a lot of options with colleges and then narrowed down to Gonzaga. So that was the college that I was planning to head to. And then some things changed there. Some people stayed around, some people left. So I wasn't too sure about that. And then the Kings kind of opened their arms and presented the opportunity to come here. And there was an opportunity for me to play a lot of minutes. So that was something that I was excited for. So made that decision and kind of have a look back. How daunting was it at the time? Because you know you hear about Gonzaga, you grew up in Australia, and it's like one of these colleges that are on t-shirts of people walk around stadiums. But then you walk away from it. Was there any point there where you're like, what the hell am I doing? Yeah, uh, there was definitely some second guessing always like, did I make the right decision? Is it too late? Like, what if I went there? What if I did that? But just the people around me just said like, if you're gonna make a decision, just stick with it. Um, like you can't control what could have happened, what could have been, so it's just, Look in the future and just do what you can with what you're given. Well, it's been going great this year. You've played a heap of roles though. Like, what is your most comfortable role that you've played in this Kings team? Yeah, I think obviously different different games, different lineups, playing different roles. I think that's something that I'm used to. I think just being able to grow up, being skilled across the board, being able to do pretty much everything a basketball player needs to do and then having the coach be able to put me in different positions. I think um, I just feel comfortable just trying to help the team, just being able to make the open shot, create off the dribble if, if I see my man closing out too hard, can get by him. Um, and then defensively being able to guard different positions and kind of be a point of attack defender to try and shut down some of the best players in the league. You've got, you've got scouts watching you, they're coming, we're in a, a 40 degree gym right now um, and they're coming all the way to Sydney to hang out in Western Sydney, which is great. Um, is it? Hard to realise that that kind of is the next step on stage because you're in this, but then you have guys like from the Clippers, from other teams coming, checking you out, being like, oh, this might be, you know, one of the the, the, the fines of the draft next year. Yeah, I think it's hard to kind of, I guess, keep yourself grounded and stay in the, in the current picture we're in right now with the season when there's those guys coming in. But I think just like, coach has done a great job of just making sure it's just, if, if you focus about that, that's going to take you away from the game and that's not going to help you get there. So it's just focus on the game, focus on helping the team win and that stuff will naturally come from me trying to help the team. So I think it's just, it's obviously cool to see those people come in and just have that kind of recognition, which I think like before LaMelo and stuff came to the NBL, I think it was a bit hard and kind of Australians weren't recognised on that level, but to now have them come in into the next size program and looking at kind of like almost every single team having one and look at them as a, a draft eligible player. I think that's super cool to just see that the hard work's paying off and that that step is possibly something that could happen next year, the year after. So just see where it goes. Which of the NBA guys did you play against for the Institute? Which which guys currently there? Was Dyson Daniels there while you were there? Yeah, so I played against Dyson a bit, was on his team and got to see how he went about it every day and how he was. He's a great guy, super funny, super relaxed. So. Seeing him and the hard work he put in, and then obviously Giddy, I was just a bit young for Giddy, but got to see him obviously do his thing in the NBL and then go and perform at the highest level was super cool. And when you went against them, like Dyson, mm. you know, you're a very competitive guy, right? Mm. Um, did you feel like that, you know, you guys were of a similar level, like, because you would sometimes play against each other, right, in position? Yeah, I, I was honestly thinking like, holy shit, this dude's unreal, <laughs> like busting my ass. Am I allowed to, like, that's fine? No, you can swear as much okay. as you want. That's like, fine. busted my ass in <laughs> trainings, and I was just thinking, like, oh my God, like, this dude's going to the NBA, all this shit, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that. And then, kind of starting young and getting into that exposure, I think that helped me, and just kind of working, like, I want to get to that level one day, just putting in the work. Um, and then, when he kind of graduated, I kind of took that, that leadership role, um, looking after young guys, and kind of, I think it's just a cycle of the guys who come in young, get beat in training, get beat up, feel tired, don't want to be there. But then when you, you push through that, I think it helps you so much just having that kind of confidence that you can get through that. Flo McIntyre said you're a really funny uh, young man. Um, is that true? Do you think uh, you're, or is Geordie Hunter the funny guy of the Kings or like, yeah? Uh, I'd say I can make a few people laugh sometimes. Um, but I don't want to say I'm a funny guy because then it's just awkward if you're just not that funny. <laughs> yeah, so. That's fine, that's my whole life, so yeah. that's good. Um, uh, it's good, mate. I feel like, you're going so well. 
what's your what's the goal for you next year if NBA or not like what is your goal next year like because there is a scenario where you know you hold off mm. potentially from going over to the NBA yeah so I think kind of see how these next few games go um, talk to my circle the people around me about what's the right decision um, probably get a bit of training over in America no matter what but I think I'm just like I'm in such a great position where I'm playing a sport I love as long as I'm doing that I'm happy so and there's a reality where if I go next year and I'm not ready, like you can just be in the league for one year and then come out of it. Um, so my mentality is if it doesn't happen this year, it's because I'm not ready. So I just got to make sure I'm being ready so that when I get there, I'm going to stick around and not just be in the league for a year, cool, and then have to go other places. I want to really get there and be an impact player and help a franchise. So I think just having that mentality that I just want to be the best basketball player I can and then wherever that opportunity is to keep getting better and keep growing is and playing minutes, I think that's the, the goal for me. How have you been working on your shot? Um, you, you started really strong this season, you did a couple of game changes, but it feels like in the last couple of years your shot has changed. Mm. So how do you like maintain and improve? Yeah, like a few years ago, probably one of those nationals I kind of wasn't shooting many threes compared to how I was. And obviously started the season shooting the ball well. Um, I think a bit of that was the league didn't understand how good of a shooter I was, so started getting scouted a little bit more. Had a little bit of struggles recently, but I think just sticking with it, just trust the reps that I put in, trust the, the amount of spots that coaches put me in to get open shots and just trust that it's gonna fall. There's, you're a part of a pretty good alumni of basketball players from Canberra with, in Paddy Mills. Yep. To see hit you up ever, because there's not too many ACT guys that didn't just move there to the Institute. No, Paddy's a legend, so I went to Meyer, so I went to his old school, so oh, cool. even before then I was seeing him everywhere in the walls and hearing about his legacy, so that was super cool. Uh, I haven't got in contact to him, I'm sure he's a bit, <laughs> bit busy at the moment playing in the NBA, but I'll definitely try and hit him up and see with the boomers and stuff and that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And of all the, of the guys you go against, like the next stars, mm -hmm. Are you competitive when you go up against them? When you see, like, you're going against Sikarski or Alexander Saar, mm. and there's this guy who's meant to be in top five. Mm. You know, that's the same draft class. Yeah. Does it add a, any fire at all? Yeah, I think it's it's always competitive, no matter who you go against, but I'm sure there's a little extra there. You want to try and get the bragging rights over those guys. Yeah. And, um, obviously, seeing Alex is such a great player and so uh, projected so highly, you kind of want to go against him and show that you're at that level of being drafted highly next year. Who have you gone against? Oh, just a couple more, mate. But um, who have you gone against this year that you were like, oh, wow, that guy's pretty good? Or, uh, or that made you sort of really realise that you were know, playing with men now rather mm. than uh, younger guys? Just players in the league? Yeah, general? players in the league. Was there any, any time where someone's like first step or there was a move done or something like that? Or has it not really been like that? Yeah, I think it definitely been a few moments. I think um, playing Bryce Cotton at the start of the year, he had his struggles and kind of wasn't the player that we... We saw uh, like last year and the years before, but the second time we played him, he was he was breaked up the guard and like hitting shots that coach try, just try and say like oh like it's a bad shot like if he makes that it is what it is, but just he just keeps doing that. It's <laughs> eventually it's going to be a good shot. So adjusting to that has been pretty crazy. Just like him, Chris Golding, those guys that are such high level shooters, where just expose any mistakes that you you do and usually get away with with uh, the lower levels. So I think those guys are. Probably the two that I've had the biggest kind of welcome to the league moments. Outside of basketball, what have you been enjoying about Sydney? Because you're obviously moving to a pretty cool city. Yeah, I've just been loving the lifestyle here. There's always stuff to do, always stuff going on. So finding new places to eat, going to the beach, um, just finding new spots has been super cool to just hang out and see a cool city. Did you go to the cricket? No, nah, I didn't go to the cricket. Mum and dad went though, no, but we had training. I was pretty jealous. <laughs> Mate, thanks so much for joining us and best of luck for the rest of the year and everything that's going to come. No worries, thank you. Cheers, man. Appreciate it. Sorry, man, thank it's you. always like so awkward with these things, but um, nah, no, you right. did great. Yeah, you used to it.